Hey YouTube, Ethan here. Today I'm talking about petroleum boilers and oxygen not included. If you've never built a petroleum boiler, this video will explain what it is, how it works, why you should use it, and we'll take a look at some examples of petroleum boilers so you can gain the knowledge to build your own or just copy the ones that you see here. All petroleum boilers follow the exact same concept of heating up crude oil in order to turn it into petroleum, but there's a lot of intricacies that are involved in making one work properly. Because of this, they work as a direct replacement for the oil refinery to increase the efficiency of your base. As usual, my videos are timestamped, so feel free to skip around to the information that you're seeking, but I highly recommend watching the whole video so you understand what makes this boiler so powerful and how you can get creative and build your own. So why build a petroleum boiler in the first place? Petroleum is one of the most important elements that you need during your mid-game transition and oxygen not included. Power generation from petroleum is insane at 2000 watts per generator, by far the most out of all the generators in the game. And it will be incredibly useful to stockpile petroleum for rocket engines as you're calling in your space travel. It is also useful for plastic production via the polymer press, the blast shot maker for blast shots, and jet suits, which have just been tweaked in the November 2025 quality of life free update, making them much more viable to use than before. And petroleum is also used in the molecular forge to make visco gel or supercoolant. This makes petroleum production a high priority throughout your entire mid game to late game. Of course, the most logical way to produce petroleum is by using the oil refinery. It's easy to set up, being just a simple pipe in and a pipe out, and connecting power, and boom, you have your petroleum. The problem with the oil refinery is that it requires a duplicate to operate them and converts crude oil to petroleum at only a 50% rate. You also need to deal with the natural gas from the refinery as a byproduct. When you consider the efficiency of a petroleum boiler to that of the oil refinery, you start to see the huge waste that is being created if you're running your entire playthrough just off the refinery itself. Of course, this doesn't mean that the refinery is completely useless. In fact, you'll want to use it until you have access to the resources to build a boiler. Just don't intend to have the oil refinery as your permanent setup unless you want multiple duplicates operating it for the duration of your playthrough. Let's take a look at a very simple boiler and break down how it works. This is a very basic, very low-tech boiler that requires no duplicate labor after it is set up and converts oil to petroleum at a 100% rate with no byproducts. As we work our way through how the basic boiler works, we'll start to see the flaws in it and we'll start to work towards building a much more robust boiler that you saw at the beginning of this video. The first thing that you'll notice about this boiler is that both chambers are completely vacuumed out. This is critical to any scenario where you're trying to manage heat because any sort of atmosphere causes heat transfer to occur where you may not want it to. A petroleum boiler simply boils crude oil to turn it into petroleum. So we can go to our database and see that at around 400 degrees, this state change will occur. The most common way to access this type of heating will be either a volcano or natural magma from the bottom of your asteroid. But keep in mind that magma will always be at least 1409 degrees or higher, so we need to be careful to control the oil exposure to this temperature, otherwise we'll end up heating our crude oil way past the petroleum boiling point of 538 degrees and turning it into sour gas, after which it cannot be turned back into petroleum. Just a side note here, a sour gas boiler is also a very cool and very powerful way of making power, but we'll talk about that in another video. To control the heat exposure, we're going to be using a mechanized airlock in between tiles to conduct this heat. The common tile materials are steel or diamond, but you can use anything that you have available that can handle the heat of the magma while also having relatively high thermal conductivity to transfer this heat. And we're going to hook this mechanized airlock up to a thermal sensor and set the sensor's value to 410 degrees for now. The 410 degree value will likely have to be tweaked in order to make this boiler more efficient. So don't be afraid to adjust it for your own setup. For example, one of the reasons that you may wish to have a lower value is if your heat transfer is fast enough that the thermal sensor doesn't react in time to open the door, which leads to the crude oil boiling into sour gas. This is usually only an issue early on in the build, and once your flow is stable, you can leave it alone. This could also occur if the mass of your crude oil isn't enough to heat up slowly and it flashes into sour gas. The chamber on the right is where we dump our crude oil, and the chamber on the left is where the petroleum ends up being moved from around the map. A setup like this pairs very well with the infinite storage solutions, which I covered in another video that I'll link in the upper right corner. We start the boiler by dumping crude oil with no heat, so the thermal sensor should be set to send a green signal if the temperature is below 410 degrees. This will keep our door open. We want to make sure to get enough mass built up so that we don't flash the oil directly into sour gas. Since crude oil is heavier than petroleum, you'll never have to worry about oil being dumped in the petroleum side as long as you're heating it up fast enough, and this is where tweaking the thermal sensor will be critical. 
As an additional safety measure, I have added a liquid element sensor just before the liquid would start flowing over the edge into the petroleum chamber. If this sensor ever detects crude oil, it shuts off the liquid vent and therefore giving the pool of oil more time to heat up. Once there are at least two tiles worth of oil present, we can start to add heat and this is when we can switch the thermal sensor to send a green signal when the oil temperature is above 410, which closes the door to the heat chamber. Now the oil will have time to slowly heat up instead of flashing directly to sour gas. If you add heat too early, this is what will happen. When the oil mass is too low and too much heat is applied too quickly, it will flash directly into sour gas. So this is what we're trying to prevent during a startup. This issue is going to be the same for nearly every single petroleum boiler that you build. So always keep in mind, if you're ending up with sour gas, it's usually because you don't have enough crude oil present before you start adding heat. This also means that you should keep your mechanized airlock door open when you're building the surrounding materials Otherwise, you may start transferring heat unintentionally during your setup process that you can't easily get rid of. You will also run into another problem of magma solidifying to the right where the magma is touching the diamond tiles. This solidification process will eventually shield the additional heat from the magma that is supposed to heat up these diamond tiles. The solidification happens because as the heat is being extracted from the magma into the crude oil, it cools into a solid material. This is why we'll eventually want to control how much magma we use for heating up our boiler. The easiest way to deal with these solid tiles is by adding a RoboMiner inside of the magma chamber. In addition to this RoboMiner, we want to be able to clean out this debris via automation. Otherwise, the cooled igneous rock will cool down the magma quicker once it is dumped on top of it. The RoboMiner here is technically optional in the sense that you could allow duplicates to come in here through a liquid lock to mine out these solid tiles, but that's going to leave them vulnerable to magma contact and it will also allow them to pick up igneous rock which is extremely hot. On the other hand, the RoboMiner is in a vacuum, which means it will eventually overheat if left without cooling. So this is where the conductive panel comes in. The heat from the magma will not be able to overheat the miner as long as the room is vacuumed out. Otherwise, any sort of atmosphere will eventually transfer heat into the robo miner and causing it to break. It's also worth noting that eventually the volcano will produce too much magma for this tiny chamber, so you'll need to drip the magma here in order for us not to ruin our build. This is where the other mechanized airlock comes in, along with some automation. The liquid sensors at the bottom are constantly checking for the presence of magma. If magma has solidified, it sends a signal to drip more magma from the upper mechanized airlock from the volcano room. But before this command to drip more magma is passed through, we're allowing a few seconds to pass via a filter gate for the robo miner to clear out any solid tiles and for the igneous rock debris to fall into a separate chamber below. All of this automation seems fairly complex, but it will be explained more thoroughly at the end of this video when we take a look at a far more elaborate build. If you'd like to copy this setup, feel free to pause the video to take note of this automation. I always recommend keeping the automation outside of your main petroleum boiler, so this way you can always change things if your current setup is not doing the job properly. It's a lot easier for your duplicates to access these automation devices outside of the boiler than having to go back in to change anything. I've also added a way to move the petroleum out of the chamber to where you want it to go on your map. And obviously this is going to be achieved via a liquid pump. Here we're going to encounter another issue. Since the petroleum is going to be extremely hot, it's very hard to use pre-spaced materials for this liquid pump. So we need a way to cool the petroleum. Now you could actively cool this with an aqua tuner using crude oil or petroleum, but this is going to cost you a lot of power and it's very inefficient to cool something like this with crude oil or petroleum because of the specific heat capacity of either of these liquids. Nectar and polluted water are just not going to work because they're going to boil off inside of your pipes since the petroleum is just so hot. So we have to find another way. This is where we introduce our heat exchange. The oil that is coming into the boiler is already sufficiently cool enough to perform this cooling. So we're going to route the cool oil coming into the chamber against the flow of petroleum. This also has the added benefit of heating up the incoming oil, which means it will take less heat away from the magma. This whole process is called a heat exchange. We could also route this cool oil directly over our robo miner, which is going to help keep it cool without external cooling from an aqua tuner. I also added some temperature plates out of diamond to make sure that I get as much cooling out of the incoming oil as possible, and now we have a fully functioning petroleum boiler. Now that we've built a fairly low-tech and easy-to-manage boiler, let's take a look at the one from the beginning of the video and see how it compares. This boiler implements all of the features in the one that we just built, but it is much more robust. First of all, there are access points to various locations on the boiler for servicing, including the magma room, the boiler room, the base of the counter flow, the automation which is entirely accessible from the outside for easy changes or additions, and the robo miner. I always like to leave a way for duplicates to come back in here without having to destroy a significant part of my builds. The boiler itself has a much more substantial counter flow and heat exchange of the incoming oil versus the low tech version. 
The incoming oil is first checked by a filter to make sure that only oil passes into the chamber, just in case we get some mixture in the pipe. After we cool the RoboMiner with the incoming oil, it goes directly into the heat exchange at around 90 degrees and enters the boiler room at around 392 degrees, resulting in our magma doing a lot less work to change this oil into petroleum. This heat exchange is done by routing the liquid pipes that's breaking in the oil against the flow of the hot petroleum that is leaving the boiler. The radiant liquid pipes here are made of aluminum because it has a much higher thermal conductivity than other metals available when I built it. And I have the end of the run made of ceramic insulated pipe to stop the oil from getting too hot and turning into petroleum before it leaves the pipe. This would obviously break my pipe and break the build. I did have issues with this happening when I first started up the boiler, but because I left access for my duplicates to come in here and be able to fix this on the fly, it wasn't that much of an issue. All of this helps the petroleum leave the boiler at 403 degrees and get cooled all the way to 111 degrees at the liquid pump. This means that the pump could even be built out of gold with no external cooling. Throughout this playthrough, I experimented with trying to cool the oil down farther after it leaves the liquid pump, but it ended up being redundant. Again, we're using diamond and steel for our boiler tiles, and wherever else I'm running automation or electrical wires in contact with extreme temperatures. Everything else is going to melt here, so you want to make sure that you keep an eye on the melting temperatures of the metals that you're using, and where you're building them. The startup sequence is going to be the same as the low tech boiler. Basically, you'll want to make sure that you have an adequate amount of oil in the boiler room so that you don't flash it to sour gas. Just toggle the temperature sensor inside of the boiler when you have sufficient oil. I would also recommend making a save just prior to the startup so you can always try again instead of having to clean up a huge mess if something goes wrong. Experimenting is going to be a big part of starting up a boiler for the first time, but once you get it right, it's going to make boilers that you build in the future much easier. The automation here is much more elaborate than the simple boiler. Let's start with some of the easier ones. Like in my previous setup, I'm checking for crude oil at the top of my boiler chamber. If detected, a green signal is sent to a notifier which pauses my game and zooms in on this issue, allowing me to deal with it ASAP. I'm also checking for the presence of magma in the magma holding room, and this is just in case you start up your boiler before you've collected enough magma to keep it going automatically. Seeing no magma in this holding chamber means that I need to stop bringing in more oil, otherwise I'll flood the heat exchange with oil and break the entire boiler. I have this attached to a filter gate so it doesn't stop the flow of oil into the boiler during my magma dumps. I also have a signal switch which turns the flow of oil on automatically during the priming phase for startup. This is the only time that's used so you could delete it afterwards. But I recommend keeping it installed just in case you have to go back to prime it. The temperature sensor for the boiler is set to 403 degrees. When this sensor falls below this temperature, it closes the mechanized airlock and brings in more heat into my boiling chamber. The rest of the automation on the right is just a convenience feature. The left side is where things start to become very messy. To start off, we're checking for the temperature at the base of the chamber where our magma falls to. If this temperature falls below 450 degrees, we send a green signal into the memory toggle gate set port. This 450 degrees is very particular. I chose this number because at 450 degrees, I'm still providing sufficient amount of heat that can be transferred into my diamond tiles and into my crude oil to turn it into petroleum. Anywhere below this and it starts to get a lot slower, so I'd rather just replenish the heat with more magma. This green signal will turn the memory gate output port to green, which will open the door underneath the igneous rock, allowing it to fall into the pit below once the RoboMiner activates, making room for more magma to drop in. At the same time, we send a green signal out to the RoboMiner and a filter gate with a value of 40 seconds. This filter gate sends a green signal after the countdown has finished, which does three things simultaneously. First, it sends a green signal to the reset port of the memory gate, closing the bottom door after all of the igneous rock has been mined out after the 40 seconds. Then, it opens the magma holding door, allowing more magma to fall and continue heating up the boiler. Finally, it sends a green signal to the NOT gate, turning it into a red signal, which leads into a buffer gate with a value of 5 seconds to send a red signal to a mechanized airlock. This is a secondary door that helps keep too much magma from falling into the boiler and coming in contact with the RoboMiner. The end result of all this chaos is that we're operating various machines and doors in a certain sequence. Let's watch the operation as I explain what we're trying to accomplish. First, we check for temperature at the heating chamber 
and at a low temperature level, we're mining out the solidified igneous rock and letting it drop into a separate pit. We give the Robo Miner 40 seconds to complete this task, after which we'd let more magma drop into the chamber to bring in more heat. Now you could simplify all of this automation with a series of buffer gates and filter gates as well, or by adding additional checks in various locations to hone in the efficiency. This is another reason why it's a good idea to leave various access points throughout a boiler like this, just in case you decide you want to change something, or add your own automation into the system. If you'd like to directly copy this design, I'm going to show screenshots now of the overlays that will help you out. But realistically, unless your main source of power is petroleum and you have a very high demand electrical grid, this setup and even the low tech setup shown earlier is going to support your base throughout your entire playthrough. I've had this petroleum boiler running now for about 800 cycles, so it has been running for a substantial amount of time without any issues. Because we're dealing with very extreme temperatures and very low tolerances, it is very handy to have access ports open at multiple areas of a petroleum boiler, no matter which design you choose to build. And again, I just want to reiterate that it's worth saving before starting up a petroleum boiler, so if something does go wrong during the startup, you can easily restart and then try starting it again. This is going to be a lot easier than trying to clean up a huge mess just in case something goes wrong during the startup. And I can attest to this, when I was building this on stream, I had to restart multiple times in order to get this boiler working correctly. Most of my issues came down to using the wrong metals inside of the boiler chamber, so being able to reload the game allowed my duplicates to go in there and change these metals without being exposed to magma. I also had issues where I had to rebuild the boiling chamber because it was too small and I was getting crude oil that was accumulating instead of changing into petroleum and the buildup of all the crude oil eventually caused the ceramic insulated tiles to break because of the pressure that was built up. So don't be afraid to do this if it's your first time building it and I also think it's worth experimenting in sandbox mode if you're trying to build a unique design because it will save you a lot of time and headache than having a magma spill somewhere in your colony. There are many different solutions to a petroleum boiler, so no matter what design you choose to build, or if you want to build your own, I really hope that this video has given you the tools to fully understand how to build one. If you learned something, or if you just enjoyed the video, please leave a rating to help out the channel, and subscribe for more videos. If you've never been to one of my live streams, I'm online several times a week, so come hang out and say hello. And thank you as always to all of the viewers who've continued to support this channel. As always, I'm Ethan, and I'll see you guys in the next video.